All right, welcome everyone to the last session of our micro-credential forum. Um, and you're really in for a treat because we are ending things on a dialogic note. This session will be a panel discussion on the opportunities and the challenges, and as well as pockets of existing innovative approaches to building micro-credential credit pathways. Our panelists are Adrian Galway, the Executive Director of the Ontario Council on Articulation and Transfer, John Reed, Interim Associate Vice President, Indigenous Engagement and Partnerships at UConn University, First Nations Initiatives, Sheila LeBlanc, Associate Vice President, Continuing Education at the University of Calgary, William Gage, Associate Vice President, Teaching and Learning at York University, and our very own Rich Lutet, Microcredential Program Manager at eCampus Ontario. Rich will be the person moderating uh, this panel discussion, uh, and I will assist with moderating the, the Q&A. Uh, so please do drop in your questions in the Q&A box that you see under uh, this presentation screen. Uh, you can plop questions in there throughout uh, this session, and we will make time to address some of them at the end. Uh, for right now, though, I will pass it right over to Rich to get the panel discussion started. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, we're really excited for today's uh, final discussion. Um, really, since 2017, the conversation on micro-credentials has evolved significantly. We're now at a place where in Ontario, there are more than 1,700 micro-credential programs that are eligible for student financial aid through a historic policy update. We've heard lots of stories this week around the opportunities and challenges associated with industry partnerships for micro-credential programming. We heard about programs this week that are purposefully designed to support the lifelong learning journey, focused on upskilling, reskilling, supporting advancement, retention, and accessibility to the workforce. We heard examples where employers are removing requirements for traditional degrees in their job postings. And we see examples within individual institutions where micro-credential articulation into larger programs is already a part of the development process with Senate committees and well-defined governance. As we consider stacking, laddering pathways at scale to support a lifelong learning journey, in our panel discussion today, we look forward to exploring some of the opportunities and challenges of an interconnected micro and macro education system and the ways that we can tackle some of these issues together as a community. So welcome, and I look forward to our discussion. To kick things off, um, I first I'd like to invite all the panelists to turn on their video screens, and and uh, this will be the moment where, as you speak, you'll your your image will appear for our audience. <clears throat> I'd like to start our conversation off focusing on the students we serve, and so the first question I'd like to pose to this panel is, what would micro credential pathways and laddering mean for our students? Would anybody like to start that one? I'll tackle that one. Uh, Rich, good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Adrian Galway from the Ontario Council on Articulation and Transfer. And the mandate of my organization is to help students move efficiently uh, through the post-secondary system. So to take the credits that they've earned um, maybe they're moving them to um, to another institution, another program, and to really get credit um, and recognition for what they've done for the purpose of attaining a credential. Uh, I know there's a bit of there's a school of thought that credentials are irrelevant and no one cares about credentials anymore. But the evidence that we see with our students, what they want is they actually want the credential. They want that that is the currency um, that's uh, out there, and they want that recognition for for what they've done. So with micro-credentials for pathways and laddering, it really is giving students that, um, that recognition and opportunity to earn the, uh, earn the credential. So I'm, I see the, um, the real value is there's sort of three, three main things. It's the re recognition for what they've done, that this, this means something in our world that you know, values credentials. It gives students the opportunity to get into a path or onto a pathway that could lead to that um, credential. So not everyone maybe has to come in to, you know, first year 101 courses, they can come in with a, a different educational experience. And then the third is efficiency. 
So the um, at ONCAT, we don't see students wanting to transfer their credits for the sake of transfer because it's fun to jump to, around to a bunch of different institutions. They're doing it because they're trying to get somewhere more efficiently. Um, and for the most part, that's into the into the labor market. So having um, helping students do that through kind of a purposefully designed system is uh, is going to be of high value to them as they move on through their both their educational journey and into their career journey. Rich, if, if I might uh, just uh, riff on what Adrian was saying a little bit, a couple of things that she said are uh, reminding me of some conversations I've had before, and I completely agree with everything that Adrian just said. It's uh, it, it's the recognition for the work, but but also framing that recognition in a way that our employers uh, are are looking for. You know that that this is a the education that the students have completed gives them a training, uh, but also a skill set that the employer is really needing that recognizes the skills and competencies that the students have developed. But again, intentionally, I'll use Adrian's word because she used the word intentional in in, uh, in her word in uh, when she was speaking that it's an intentional design that's going to help. Um, the employers understand what the students have done and help the students to be able to articulate what it is they've learned and the skills and competencies they have developed to the benefit of, of their future employers. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't agree more with what Adrian was saying. Thank you. I'd love to build on that a little bit further as well. Quite interesting when we think about options for learners and particularly when we think about lifelong learning over a career that changes and transitions. My mind, what <clears throat> micro-credentials provides is a unique opportunity to try before you buy, a little taster. Is this a career you're interested in? Is this a, a pathway you want to uh, take on without a significant investment of time, money, and energy, but, but to taste and to try and then uh, take that pathway? So absolutely agree. It's creating options, it's creating choices, and it's creating pathways and doorways uh, that have ladders in behind them to create a, a larger credential if we design them more, and a larger career growth pathway for transition. Thank you, Sheila. John, would you like to add something? Yeah, it, it's also a, a real uh, affirmation of the importance of skills. Um, certainly, we've had dialogues about the ability of, of, of degree programs to build uh, good quality learners, good quality problem solvers, critical thinkers. But sometimes it really is about uh, the, the, the baseline skills. I was working yesterday with my staff on on doing uh, some computer-based work, and and the one person had never encountered that before, even though it's built into their Word documents. And so there's a real example of there's a, a foundational easy skill that can be accomplished through micro-credentialing that helps them do their work. So, so as much as we want to create pathways, it is also about people's abilities to do their job more efficiently. That's great. I think we've transitioned really nicely into where I'd hoped we'd go next. And that is, you know, at a really high level, what are some of the big opportunities or big challenges that you see when, um, when looking at how to map the micro and the macro education system together? You know, as you're asking the question, I knew this question was was coming and where my mind was going, though honestly rich, was graduate school and, and a huge opportunity. Not, not an awful lot of attention is paid to graduate school, um, the post undergrad experience that students have. And I'll just be really brief here because I'd, I'd love to know what other people think about this too. But the, the idea that coming out of a master's degree uh, if it's a terminal degree or someone's not anticipating going on for their, their doctoral degree or, or anything else that they're going into the workforce. Definitely when you're done a doctoral degree, you've got your PhD. Most uh, of those graduates are not going on to faculty jobs anymore. But what can, uh, how, how can a micro-credential um, mapping uh, to, to that macro experience mean for 
again, I come back to the ability or, or, or the, 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 the articulation of skills and competencies that the student has learned through their graduate school to help, the, to help a future employer understand what their abilities actually are when, when perhaps they've done, I, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, I'm a biomechanics professor. They've, they've learned how to do 3D uh, kinetic and kinematic analyses great uh but you're not going to have to do any of that in the job that 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 i might hire you to do what else can you do you know what what are the what are the skill sets that you've developed because they are there are many many of us have uh post uh grad degrees here so uh, we didn't just learn how to do 3d kinematic analysis we learned a whole bunch of other things what are they and how could we use micro credentials to frame that skills and competency development uh, to benefit those graduates, graduate student, uh, you know, graduate students when they graduate after their master's or PhD, something I've been mulling over. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'd love to jump in there and build on, on what uh, uh, William was saying in terms of start to think about validation of some of the competencies that have been acquired through. Uh, traditional education and how do we curate and validate some of those pieces and, and try and package it for employers understanding but also for the learners understanding what did they learn how can they, they uh, articulate that to an employer it was absolutely a conversation I think across the you know graduate schools uh, nationwide and an important one um, and so so thank you for posing that that William but I Coming back to the, the, the broader question about some of the biggest opportunities, uh, some of the opportunities I really see are us becoming, as a full post-secondary system, a more responsive system. Uh, Micro-credentials challenges us to think about how do we work with uh, employers more more consciously. How do we think? How do we work with governments more consciously? It, it actually creates a space where we can start thinking about um, how do we create in and out opportunities over a lifetime for learners and package it uniquely. So, uh, what I think really is the biggest opportunity in terms of micro credential learning pathways is creating doorways creating doorways on an ongoing basis, but also creating the pillars that need to come together to work together. If we think about um, government identifying in a particular region a huge skills gap or uh, an employment gap, there's opportunities for us to think about how do we build pathways for both young uh, students, those that are coming into our system, those that are going out, but also those that are mid-career. That's, that's part of the uh, opportunity, I think, that micro-credentials creates for us that, that we have to get better at becoming a more responsive educational system if we're going to continue to be, play a meaningful part in the professional development and, and workforce development uh, that's needed for us as a post-secondary system to, to contribute to employers, to contribute to government and be part of that learning ecosystem over time. I'd like to pick up on um, Sheila's use of the word responsiveness. Because when I think about my, prior to joining ONCAT, I was at uh, George Brown College for over a decade. And when I think about the population of students that we served, who were, most of whom had a full-time job or worked close to full-time hours while doing a full-time uh, academic program. And uh, the, we're still sort of locked into a very K to 12 model of teaching starts at nine, ends at five. Uh, you have to do it in this, you know, in this order. It's not really reflective of students' um, students' actual lives and uh, and what they're dealing with. So I think there's an opportunity around micro credentials to both provide kind of an in incentive, like you've done this, you've you know you've achieved these goals, um, and deliver things a bit differently. So mo move into more of a modular system of delivery and. You know, there's some pedagogical challenges around that. And I do really worry about making sure we're still producing critical thinkers. And I think there is a value of a, you know, immersive full-time education experience. But this gives us more flexibility and students want more flexibility. They they want that kind of idea of, I, I did this micro-credential, maybe I need to step out and I need to work full-time for a couple of months and then take the next uh, the next piece on the uh, of the journey. And I think there's a real opportunity around that, that micro-credentials just kind of frees us from the nine to five, Monday to Friday delivery model that a lot of institutions are still locked into. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, I've got to pick up on responsive and think about the lifelong learning journey because you said targeted and, and some conversation that we've had with our and, and prompted by one of our previous provosts is really thinking about targeted versus immersive learning experience. So um, that you know, that undergrad student that wants to come and live on campus and experience something and, and those integrated thinking that can be developed over four or five years and those higher order skills that we work so hard to develop is one type of, of educational experience, even in a full-time graduate program versus um, what I think we're seeing a larger, not I think, I know the demographics speak to it, the changing student speaks to it in, in, in post-secondary, more and more students are looking for that targeted experience. I'm looking for some specific skills at this time. I'm looking for a pathway to my next career. I'm looking to reskill for my next career because I'm displaced. And, and so we still have that targeted learner um, as well as the immersive learner to serve. But as the targeted learning group becomes grows, that's the challenge and the opportunity for us as a system to think about how do we serve both and how do we serve them well and interweave those learning experiences so they can stack, so that there's choices and, and pathways. At the same time, we need, we need a, a governance framework that's external to the university that allows us to, and internal, frankly, that allows us to respond quickly to the changing needs of industry. Yeah, academic programs proceed, you know, glacially when it comes to change, but to be responsive in the way we're talking, we need to be able to change quickly. Now, as individuals, you know, many of us can, can adapt and change quickly, but the system doesn't necessarily allow us to change quickly. It's another, so while we are changing, we need the structures around us to change as well. And we've had conversations like that in Ontario, I know, I've been part of them. I'm not sure about uh, Alberta or, or the Yukon. Yeah, we, we certainly haven't had those discussions yet. I'd, I'd like to think we're, we're, we're moving there though. We're very early in this process. And the fact that, that we're really the only, uh, well, we are the only post-secondary education publicly funded post-secondary education uh, uh, organization in the Yukon. It, it gives you opportunity, but it also uh, creates some challenges. We're small, so it's hard to it, it's hard to throw resources in that direction. I, I like Dr. Gabon's approach to uh, the lifelong learning piece. And if we're combining opportunities, then then you know the, the degree track creates some good quality critical thinkers and problem solvers. But that doesn't necessarily prepare them for, you know, you come up with a Bachelor of Arts degree, you don't know where you're going to land five years later, and then all of a sudden you're lacking skills in certain areas. And I think that's a real opportunity with the, uh, with the micro-credentialing, uh, is if there's a broad base of offerings that, that attach themselves to whatever industry you've landed in, it's really building on those critical thinking and problem-solving skills that we've been able to develop in a in a, you know, a comprehensive arts program. Um, from a First Nation standpoint, that's what we're looking at is, is people that are coming in with uh, arts degrees or have finished a degree, or maybe they've, they're into a diploma, um, and then landing into an environment that, you know, they've got the ability to function, but it's about skills. And the micro-credentialing allows them to access skills. And at times those can be very unique or, or very specialized skills. So, but I, I, I like the idea of the application of micro-credentialing in a lifelong learning um, environment. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Um, really, really, there are really important um, targeted populations of learners that have benefit, that have potential benefits from micro-credential pathways. Um, I'd like, I'd, I'd like to just spend a, a moment considering the complexities of, of credit transfer. Um, Adrian, I think this is, you know, really in your department, it seems like a complex area prior to micro-credential programming. We have um, so many different systems and, and segments of the education system within Canada, and then you consider internationally, and then we put in this new thing called micro-credentials. Um, what, what do you see in your experience as some of the, the challenges or even potential pathways that we can, we can work together to help 
help this all move a little bit more smoothly? That's a, that's a big question. So um, ONCAT's done a lot of work. They were, it was established in 2011 to smooth that credit recognition um, pathway. And it's really done by looking at a course outline, looking at uh, from the institution student, the sending institution, looking at the course outline for um, what the student thinks is equivalent in the receiving institution and mapping um, learning objectives and, and outcomes like that's and then that's how the credit is assessed the so the currency of credit transfer is a course and the challenge with my and these learning outcomes and learning objectives so for a micro credential to really um and i should preface all of this by saying that's really hard <laughs> that's been a really hard there's all kinds of uh, and I think they've made, you know, the organization and the institutions have met, made a great, uh, great strides, but 10, 15 years ago, university, and I will pick on the universities a bit, university X was very good at saying, no, I don't accept university wise credit, but we're not, we're not going to, and really it was a little bit arbitrary and for, and for students, because we're really all about supporting the learners, very hard to explain why philosophy 101 um, from University A did not trans translate to a credit for um, philosophy 101 at University B. So there's been a ton of work around that. Um, and it's really come down to kind of having a common language, the idea of mapping outcomes, um, objectives. So for the easiest way for this to work with micro-credentials is for micro-credentials to speak, to be in the same currency. So they really do need to map to full-time for credit post-secondary course outcomes. I think that doing it any other way is going to be really challenging um, because we don't give, institutions don't give half a credit. They don't exempt students, maybe on an individual faculty basis. They may say, okay, you don't have to do this assignment. I don't think that happens. I think in reality, is it's either a, you either get the credit or you don't get the credit. So to, the most efficient way of doing this is really to build a micro credential if you want it to to ladder to build it mapping to um, a, a particular program or a suite of programs if you're doing it on learning outcomes that you should be able to map that micro credential across a number of programs but that intentionality is going to be really um really key to uh to doing this the other i'm going to be i guess i'll just talk about challenges and then other people can talk about opportunities the other challenge that you run up against um with credit transfer now is universities have residency requirements. So students have to take X percentage of their program from that institution. So if you if we envision a world where I can do a micro credential from York and I can do one from the University of Calgary and I can do one from uh, in the Yukon and assemble them all together uh, toward uh, toward a credential, you're going to run up against this residency requirement issue, which I know is a very specific policy item. But for all of us who've worked in post-secondary institutions, those are really hard to change. It's Senate. It's you know, you've got to get the Senate on board. You've got to get the faculty on board. So there's some real practical issues around doing something like that um, that uh, that aren't all that easy to to move. I'm not saying they're impossible to move, but there's really got to be will to uh, to to move them. So I will leave it at I will leave it at challenges and let somebody else take the opportunity. That's excellent. Thank you so much. Change is hard, but yet it's our one constant. Um, uh, I I want I I would like to move us on to opportunities and and maybe even uh, take the opportunity to share um, innovative examples. So I, I'm really curious, uh, Sheila, if if there's anything that comes to mind for you in terms of innovative examples of uh, maybe early adopters or leaders in the micro-credential pathway, uh, pathway space. <laughs> uh, thank you for that, Rich. And, and uh, Adrian, I completely identify when you start talking about both the challenges and some of the places that we're starting to think, how do we speak a common language? And I'll throw out there a national qualifications framework, some common language, some common pieces of, uh, and, and disaggregating the course even into smaller credit hours could be, you know, in, in credit hour equivalencies is some of the dialogue that we're having. And so 
that being framed, I want to share a couple of the innovative examples that, that are, are we've, we've been playing with at the University of Calgary now, both in, in Ontario and Alberta, our governments have been um, throwing out some funding opportunities to say, hey, let's play in this space. We're not 100% sure how to do it, but let's, let's get some examples going. So a couple of what I would say are strong uh, examples of creating um, opportunities in the university context. So we offer graduate degrees. Uh, William was talking about how important it is for us to think about graduate degree competencies that are learned. Uh, but what we've seen in, in particularly in Alberta and in Canada, a number of displaced oil and gas engineers, <laughs> that, that field has been changing rapidly over the last number of years. And we're seeing this increased demand for software engineers. So what we, we did, we worked together, we created a, a micro-credential, um, what I would call it's a crosswalk. So these are engineers, displaced, highly skilled individuals already with practice. And we, we got a short micro-credential, assess learning, done in three months, that gave them the gaps filled to help them go right into a master's of software engineering. So a micro-credential gap pathway, a crosswalk to change careers for those that are getting displaced that are highly skilled. Again, important as a Canadian economy, we don't want to lose that high-end talent out of the workforce, but they didn't have work using their current skills. So that was one area where we created a short duration program. And uh, another one that I think is kind of interesting is we start thinking about, again, graduate school being in the unique domain of the university um, sector in many cases, that the alternate graduate school admissions requirements, it can be tough. You, you have to have a degree in this. You must have a GPA of this. You must Those kind of entrance requirements in graduate school can be very narrow and constraining and not necessarily create an open space for people that are capable of doing that graduate degree. And so one of the areas we've been exploring, and this is particularly interesting in tech. I mean, we know digital disruption, technology disruption happening across all fields of practice. But as it relates to this particular example, we worked with the, this is continuing education working with our faculty of computer science, created a short micro-credential on um, video game design, okay? How do you create video game design? This is just a short one week intensive pro program that if someone completes the assessment, uh, there's all kinds of, it's open enrollment, anyone can take it, but there's some recommended things. You should know this, you should know this, you should know this. They take it in your classic adult learning uh, cycle. They may or may not get through it, but if they complete it well, it can be used as an alternate emission strategy. You have to have an undergrad degree in anything. And then this program to say, hey, you're good at this stuff. We'll consider you uh, as part of our graduate school potential um, pool. Uh, again, interesting ways to think about how do we recognize other forms of learning? How do we test in instead of test out <laughs> some of the potential learners for the future by allowing them an opportunity to evidence what they can do and, and work with them through a micro-credential structure? So I'm excited about some of those areas that we're playing. Of course, in the middle school, uh, middle skill space and stackability, like occupational health and safety and program management and IT spaces, lots of examples in the continuing education world from the past. But it's often that, that traditional academy moving in there and how we work together with our traditional academics to try and create the micro-credential pathways that, that, that Adrian spoke, spoke about, intentionally designing those pathways in collaboration with our faculties, I think is the space that we need to go if we're really going to get the impact out of what micro-credentials can do for, for our uh, entire educational system, employers, and, and uh, learners. Thank, thanks for the opportunity to share there, Rich. Thank you. I, I really love the, the, the phrase testing in instead of testing out. Um, I'm wondering, Will, if you've seen any uh, interesting use cases of micro-credentials or even their potential in the future. Yeah, thanks, Rich. Um... Yeah, I think so. It's, it's not. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, but we've been we've been talking about this using micro credentials as an access pathway uh, to higher education. And uh, something that that Sheila said right at the beginning of our conversation, I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. She used the word taster, and uh, that resonated with me because that's actually the word I've been searching for for a while. <clears throat> so now I've got it. Thanks, Sheila. What we and I also want to give credit where credit is due here. I don't know if if Sean Karaj is uh, listening uh, and watching this talk, but he's he's now the the new uh, uh, vice provost academic down at uh, Toronto Metropolitan. Uh, so they they scooped him from us uh, 
but and good for him he's amazing it's his idea he's the first one who said this to me that we could use micro credentials as a way for people to uh we were using the word try on higher education i'm going to use the word taste higher education now so uh, and this is particularly important i think for uh, uh, traditionally marginalized or underrepresented groups um, who, who might not have ever seen themselves as, as individuals going to higher uh, education, be it college or university uh, after high school. Um, and we all know that pursuing you know, college and, and university can be expensive in terms of time and, and obviously money. Um, can we use micro credentials, uh, credit bearing micro credentials to allow uh, such students to uh, come into our institutions, try something at a college or university level, build confidence that, yeah, heck yeah, I can do this. Um, and if they don't like it, they can leave for sure but they leave with something as opposed to doing, you know, the, the first semester of first year, five courses, five, you know, half credit courses or something like that. And go, I don't like this and, and leaving, but without anything, can they try a micro credential as a pathway into the university to, um, to try on to taste higher education, build some confidence. And if I do like it, then I can continue uh, with more. If they do leave, they leave with a recognition of some skills and competencies that they've developed um, that they can show a potential employer to say, yeah, I know how to, to do this. Um, Sean and I and some colleagues uh, from our Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies and colleagues at Loyalist College started talking about, could we, could we do something like this to um, help students, potential students, I should say, in, in and around, let's say, the Belleville area, which is, you know, Loyalist catchment area, more or less, to, to try on some college education, maybe in a business kind of sense, uh, business skills. And if they like it, could, could those count? towards starting something at York University if they wanted to continue and maybe end up with a business degree. Um, but if they don't like it, they could leave and say, you know, now I've, I've got these particular skills, these uh, competencies. Uh, maybe they don't use those words, but they can demonstrate in no uncertain terms that I know how to do this and you need someone who does this so you should hire me in, in the absence of further higher education. That's, I think, uh, an important, it could be a, an important game changer for, for many of our, our marginalized uh, communities. And I think it could also be really beneficial uh, for older adults, you know, in thinking about the lifelong learning. I think about my own, my own mother, who over the years as I was growing up, she would take courses from Trent University, and it increased her skill set. But there was micro credentials didn't really kind of exist back back in the day, so she didn't have something that she left with to say. Now I know this piece. She could describe it to a potential employer, um, but there wasn't a micro credential, and obviously the internet and LinkedIn didn't exist back then either. So. Um, anyway, I'm going to stop there because I could probably ramble on about this all day long. Uh, thank you, Sean, for the idea, uh, if you're listening, and, uh, and thank you, Sheila, for the language now, uh, taster. That's great. Thank you, Will. So I, I think we've heard that, you know, there's, there is, you know, a really good opportunity here for purpose-built purpose lifelong learning, micro-credential credit transfer pathways designed with the appropriate mapping, and some institutions are doing it. Uh, that's, that's really awesome. Um, I wondered if we could get your perspective, John, on um, with all of this opportunity, 
how do you how do you manage you know where to go how to take how to move forward with what and when and Yukon U being a small institution um I was curious how are you managing all of these different opportunities that are available in micro credentials yeah um I, I wish I had a more complete answer for you the we are so much at the beginning of this dialogue. Um, you know, we're trying to engage with the Yukon government about creating a, a framework. We're starting dialogues internally to have a look at uh, what the implications are on the academic end. Um, we're blessed with a, a you know a, a good quality continuing education department that's looking at things on their end. Um, but we're really battling a lot of the questions. I mean, I, I listened to. Uh, Dr. LeBlanc talking about some of the opportunities at the graduate level and some of the structures that are being placed, uh, pulled together in Alberta. And we're really on the other end of that spectrum. We're really looking at just having a dialogue about what this looks like and how it works. One of the pieces that we, that we think are, are is an opportunity that might work is that um, you know many of our First Nations are blessed with, with uh, rural and remote geographies. But that also limits their access to three credit, 15 week, 45 hour, um, the, the conventional model. And maybe there's an opportunity there that if we're using micro credential opportunities, we have the ability to reach out to them in a, in a much uh, more uh, fulfilled way. But it, it's also, you know, that remoteness interferes with uh, a person's ability to to access a, a three credit course in, in, in some way. In, in the, I, I guess in the complex sense, it's really about trying to bring together the dialogues about rural access, um, distance learning, you know, finding some methodology of authentic evaluation in the middle of all that. Um, and then, you know, certainly I, I love uh, William's conversation about uh, access and um, reaching out to, to alternative communities um, and the opportunity that they give. But it, it's also about the discussion, where do those credentials lead? And, you know, certainly the skill development is there. And, um, but, you know, if you've put effort into accumulating seven or eight micro-credentials, we'll, are they leading anywhere? So, I mean, there's a certain risk. I mean, micro credentials are still new, and we're you know we're still massaging kind of the the, the end result of that, and what those are going to look like um, can be a bit of a challenge. But but we're we're in a zone where we're asking the questions and 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 you know seeing what we can build off in terms of other accreditation processes. And I mean, there are there really are quite a range of accreditations out there. Um, and where does this fit in? Is it simply academic or is it more than that? Um, do we have an independent accreditation process just for micro-credentialing? I had seen, I, I think there was a question in the Q&A about uh, a, a national framework so that, you know, if you've, if you've got something that's done in the Yukon that's transferable to Ontario uh, or vice versa. So. So that, that's kind of rambling and it's all over the place, but that's you know really where we are in that discussion when you're at the beginning, you're just asking yourself what and where and how, and and I, I think that's where we are. And uh, you know, a new university, a small university, and it's you know, there's lots of gaps to have conversations about. Thank you, John. Yes, yeah, certainly with the rate of technological change that we're experiencing and the high, high volume of uh, part-time learners these days, uh, it is a really interesting time to be tackling some mm -hmm. of these issues and be considering these programs as new solutions going forward. I can see that our our chat and Q&A Q &A has been on fire during this conversation. So I, I think we have about six minutes. And um, so I'm going to invite Tommy to come back and join us and um, take us through some of the uh, audience questions for our panelists. Thanks, Tommy. All right, Rich, you're right. I mean, the we can see that the chat has been going crazy and people are sending in Q&As as well. And I think that's an indicator of a very engaging and lively conversation. So why don't we address some of these uh, audience questions? Well, and William, maybe I'll pose this one to you first, and then we'll see if the other panelists want to also jump in. So someone wrote, thanks for bringing grad school candidates up, Will. 
at CATTI, we're working away at this via gap analysis with companies and tailoring micro-credentialing programs to fill the gap, not just grad school, undergrad, and college grads too. It's about making people work ready through competency demonstrations. What are your thoughts on incorporating internships into micro-credentialing programs? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it's critical, I think. I think that the experiential component of the education that that can be obtained through a micro-credential program is a, is a critical element. When we're talking about skills and competencies, we're really talking about the, the ability to demonstrate something, whatever whatever it might be that's that's relevant. Um, we're uh, at York University. We're working hard to develop a, um, a micro credentials uh, framework that's credit bearing, so that you know. And, and I think, as uh, Adrian mentioned earlier, this this can be slow slow work uh, slogging because of you know uh, collegial governance structures they're, they're valuable but they, they tend to um, move kind of slowly but as we're developing the framework for this one of our colleagues that's working on the this the working group with me just made the suggestion should should experiential education be a mandatory component and my response was i think so but that's very much a collegial decision to be made. Um, if we're talking about credit bearing um, micro credentials, uh, I think it'd be, it's easier. And I, I think School of Continuing Studies groups around the country are, are certainly building in experiential education opportunities for students who are doing uh, uh, non-degree studies or, or, or uh, con ed uh, certificates. And that's valuable. I think Rich in, a, in an earlier life was involved in doing um, and building exactly those kinds of programs. And if we can bring that sentiment into the credit bearing and build in the, um, whether it's an internship a placement. I mean, there's there's lots of different ways to also think about experiential education and work integrated learning. Lots of ways to think about work integrated learning. Um, but build that into the micro. I think that would be really valuable. I would definitely support that and argue in favor of it. Um, I think it would be a hard proposition to disagree with. Um, I, I'd love to know what what Sheila, John, and Adrian think though. Oh, go ahead, Sheila. I noticed you yeah. unmuted. I, I'm happy to build off that. And, and certainly living in the continuing education space, you know, previously in a business faculty and, and now in continuing education for a decade, uh, seeing the different types of, of models and structures that we use across the country, the importance of a work integrated learning experience to all learners that are trying to get a career started in a space that they don't yet have work experience. Uh, learning for and, and the competencies learned in a um, I don't want to say antiseptic because it's not always that way, but in a learning classroom or a learning lab is one thing versus the confidence that an employer gets if it's been a combination of both. So the importance of, of work integrated learning to all groups, I think, is something we're seeing across uh, the literature and, and the, the employment evidence that says more likely to get employed if you have work integrated learning of some sort. Uh, if that could be co-op, apprentice, whatever, there's various forms of that experiential learning that can happen. And I, I'd like to add the point about uh, underrepresented populations or, or newcomer populations. Again, thinking about how important that is for our workforce of the future. When we think about short duration micro-credentials and adding on and contributing a work integrated learning piece to build both confidence, acculturation, and more likelihood of attaching to the world of the work as we think about encouraging and creating space or again, underrepresented or, or newcomers to this country that are also really important people that, that we need to start thinking about more broadly as an education system and finding those pathways for. So um, work integrated learning, yes. Funding for employers and employees, yes. Short duration umbrella programs that are called micro-credentials, yes. Uh, all of it, uh, just key pillars as part of the, the, the recipe, if you will, of thinking about learning at all different stages with pathways. So exciting stuff. Thank you. Yeah, shout out to our friends at Sewell, uh, who do a lot of work in developing um, 
experiential education uh, opportunities through funding. They're doing amazing work and, and some targeted focus towards graduate programs. I think it would be really critical going, going forward, bringing work integrated learning, that workplace experience for, for graduate students um, to hit the ground running. Again, I, I don't mean to, uh, I'm, not the, I'm not the Dean of the Faculty of Grad Studies. Uh, Tom, Tom I, I think from York would say the same thing, but yeah. All right, we have time for, I think, a couple of more questions. Sheila, I, I do want to say, though, you're giving us all these great words and great one-liners, uh, doorways, tasters, and the succession of yes that you, that you just gave us. I feel like we, we need that on a t-shirt at eCampus Ontario. Okay, I'll ask the this next question, um, and it's an interesting one because it's a question and the person also proceeded to provide uh, some proposed solutions or examples. How do we convince traditional degree programs, uh, institutions to open the doors to micro-credentials as a bridge for non-traditional learning journey students to access degree programs? Is this an opportunity to reimagine degree programs and revitalize higher ed? Do we see a micro-credential, for example, transferring as a credit or sequence of credits in the admission process to a degree program? Well, oh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think we're we're swimming uh, we're swimming upstream against about nine hundred years of history when it comes to traditional degree programs. Um, but I think the short answer is yes. There's an opportunity. I think there will be an opportunity that's more readily available in some disciplinary areas rather than others, I mean, more, more quickly, maybe a little more easily in some areas than in others. Uh, universities are no longer the, the ivory tower uh, institutions that perhaps they used to be, at least I'd like to think we're progressing that way, and, I, and I'm, I'm pretty sure we are. Um, but universities are run collegially and it's a good thing. It's, it's a really good thing, but it, it can be resistant to change. So new ideas take time. And I, I like to use the example of, of a viscous fluid when trying to create change in a university. Um, the harder you push on a viscous liquid, the harder it pushes back. Uh, the faster you try and move through a university, the, the harder the university pushes back. But if you're slow and purposeful, intentional, using Adrian's word, intentional, um, you can make progress. But if you try and move too quickly, you will you will definitely run into uh, run into challenges. But I think it's a, it's an ambition worth pursuing. Absolutely. I'm going to um, jump in and put in a shameless plug for the college system <laughs> because the. Uh, the college system, universities are no longer the only game in terms of degree programs. Colleges have degrees and they have a different mandate around workforce prep, around access, um, around flexibility. I think um, if we think about micro-credentials leading into degrees and it's a race, I'm quite confident in betting on the college sector will be the one who gets there first gets there first because that's part of the DNA of the college system. Um, and just from my, you know, my experience at ONCAT, there is a great, I love that example that you used about your uh, your work in Belleville um, with Loyalist. Um, colleges are doing the, they're doing this. This is what they do. Um, so I really think there's quite an opportunity to be working with on the college side to stack into degrees, which are also, also supposed to uh, relate to university degrees. So the ultimate goal is to um, then turn that into a graduate degree from a university. There should be a pathway through there, but the doorway may may actually be through a college and not through, um, through a regular university program. All right, th thank you, uh, Adrian. Uh, we're almost at time to close out. Uh, John, did you have uh, anything you wanted to add to that conversation? Uh, there were a couple pieces. I like uh, Dr. Galway's shameless plug for colleges. 
I'll make I'll make an, an equivalent shameless plug that that we refer to ourselves as a hybrid university because we pack a lot of college programming. Maybe we'll be in front of the colleges in a couple of years. Um, I, I yeah, I just wanted to touch on uh, William's uh, talk about uh, the 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 work experience piece and and Dr. Leblanc had mentioned the co-op programs and you know, the co-op programs in the eighties used to be the 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 niche that everybody wanted into a pro a co op program, but it, it, the work experience process is is just internalized with absolutely every program now. That that the whole nature of co op really looks at yesterday's kind of model, but it, it it isn't. It's 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 today's model. It's built into almost every uh, program now, and and that's refreshing. Um, so it it goes to what William was saying about. Is is the work experience piece a necessity within micro credentialing? And certainly, I think that's uh, one of the conversations that uh, one should have. All right, uh, the time is one fifty six. Just wanted to say thank you so much to our panelists, and thank you to Rich for moderating. Um, this dialogue was certainly a great way to wrap up what has been clearly a very fast paced and fulsome three days of inspirational presentations on micro-credentials and pathways for jobs. And I use the word um, inspirational really intentionally here. Uh, I know we heard the words pathways and partnerships a lot in the last three days, uh, but the word that I personally keep circling back to is the word inspired. This is my first MC forum and I'm truly inspired and heartened by the sheer level of love and care for the future of education that has been displayed in the last three days by each and every one of our speakers and staff who supported the forum, as well as every member by the audience who actively participated in listening, learning, and asking questions. At the top, on, on the very first day of the forum at the Globe and Mail Center, we started the event off with a couple of presentations that underscored the critical importance and need for innovative partnerships between academia, industry, and government. And then we proceeded over the course of the last three days to illuminate and show examples of what of some of those successful partnerships and alliances in action. Today in particular, we showed you, Evan Tapper showed you what it can look like to meaningfully and effectively navigate through the opportunities and the challenges of building and sustaining industry and academic partnerships. And then we wrap things up just now uh, with a facilitated dialogue on what building micro-credential pathways can mean through the lens of accessibility and inclusion. And along the way, we learned about Red River College's unique partnership with Skip the Dishes and their journey to building customized micro-credentials. We gained insights into a, an employer university co-development model for micro-credentials at the University of Hearst. And we heard about how blockchain technology trends support and expand educational efforts at the University of Toronto. Nicole and Catherine from Conestoga College presented to us a really strong case for how stackable micro-credentials can facilitate and evolve faculty engagement. Now, if what we saw in the last three days is a micro example of what's to come for the future of education and the future of the workforce. I think the future is in really good hands. Again, I keep circling back to the word inspired when I think of how the forum made me feel. And actually, I challenge you to put a word, a word in the chat box um, to describe how the forum has made you feel. And while you're doing that, uh, I want to share that a close second word for me, and this word is always a close second word, uh, is the word gratitude. I am really grateful for everyone who has supported the planning and the execution of this event. Uh, I want to thank everyone on my team who has been on this pathway with me in putting this event together. Uh, thank you to our amazing communications team led by Jason and consists of Somaz, Paul, Lafia, and Cindy. I'm also super grateful for our procurement and finance team and everyone on my programs and services team for their really strong support as well. Additionally, I wanna thank every person who stepped up uh, to ensure that both 
the in-person and the virtual element of this event went smoothly. And that's including our event partner, Redstone Agency. And Rebecca Jamison and Rowan Smith for showing us how to open up and wrap up this forum in a good way with their land acknowledgement and affirmation. And you will hear from Rowan uh, in a little bit. And of course, a big hearty thank you to my manager, Rich Lutet, and our CEO, Robert Luke, for their leadership and vision throughout the whole planning process of this program. Uh, thank you, as always, to the ministry for their continued support as well. I want to remind everyone that uh, there is a feedback form. I, I believe you received it in your email. I was also told that it's going to be put in the chat box. Um, please take some time to fill that out. It will help us uh, improve and uh, uh, grow the, the programs and uh, help us with ideas for future programs. And for more information on our micro-credential programs and services, including our micro-credential toolkit, uh, our employer industry matching services, as well as to join our community of practice, you can visit micro.ecampusontario.ca. Uh, I'm positive that one of my colleagues is gonna also help me paste that link into the chat box for you. Um, and here, I wanna welcome Rowan Smith from the uh, Mohawk Turtle Clan of the Haudenosaunee to do a land affirmation as we close out. Rowan, over to you. Thanks, Tom. Um, it was a great session. I heard a lot of great questions and it's exciting for me because I'm still young, right? So as I go into post-secondary, I get to, and being a part of this, I get an inside look of what's to come and what my options are. So um, it's really, I'm really honored to be here. Um, but yeah, I'd just like to close everybody out in a good way. So if you could remove any accessories you have, hats or hoods, um, that would be awesome. Okay, and then I'll just begin. Ne dani ge kote eswat eji swara hosi us <laughs> ikai wengo sawara. Ne haji wabu kanto sungwai di sungwa wiga nohnyo. Ne ne awe sa skano dunohnyo. Ne di ne endwe hen ikia ska anji waya ngwani goha. Scott did you know you need to gain you took on one go ha. Danny and then in Jiwa Troy set a Wednesday do no ha did no hunkwa. Neko to send ye ha. Nadine and Dwe hang. Guego did you go no hino. Need to gain you took on one go ha. Danny and Dwa Troy. Hot a hoodie new touch nagate sat in a hoy and in here. Nadine and Dwe hang. Scott de etino hino. Need to gain you took on one go ha. Danny and Jiwa Troy. Hot day, said it will go on asking a day. A touch rods out, need to say wine to it, said it will go on it. Sat now sang away, hey, oh, handle out in shiny old gate. Needing it into a hank to sell an ohin yo, said it will go on asking a day. Need to gain your jerk to and go on to go ha. Dana ain't in you watch away, gain your kadagi, had your cat kyono. Need your cat to you, need your cat nido, scanner don't up to you. Needing it into a hank, dare to know in you, had your cat kyono, dear kennido. Need to gain his job to and go and go ha. Down at ANG watch away how how get go ahead and hang agree some go ahead so. Need sort the set down a scan or I do not do no. Need to end away hang the set or no hang no go ahead and hang agree some go ahead so. Need to gain his job to and go and go ha. Down at Tony Sagat go any get Sagat get that go no hang no. Need get so and get quite one and a go ahead go scan or host a go ahead set there go squad no. Down at all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rowan. And that is it for me and the rest of the uh, micro-credential forum uh, team. Everyone, thank you so much for making the time to be with us. Take good care, uh, be safe, and enjoy the rest of your day and weekend ahead. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>